Good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, our celebration and panel discussion for Mayor Rizzo's fantastic new book, um, Culture for Cities? Question mark, a conversation about the role of the arts in Baltimore and Newark. And it's really to celebrate uh, Mayor's book, uh, uh, which we're gonna show the slide right now. Uh, come, uh, come be shocked, Baltimore, beyond John Walters and the wire, Mayor Rizzo. Uh, first, I wanted to acknowledge uh, really the lands that we're on, the unceded and stolen lands that we're on, which are of north of the Raritan River in New Jersey, the Muncie Lenape lands. Um, and uh, th these are lands that are ancient, um, really that were occupied before and also uh, during and after the, uh, the glacier, which began to recede um, over 8,000 years ago. Uh, so the Muncie Lenape have been really the, um, the people who have been on this land, cultivating the land. And it wasn't until uh, the Dutch launched their raid from the bottom of New Amsterdam that uh, basically began to push out um, the indigenous peoples from Corlears Hook, which is now underneath the Williamsburg Bridge, but also at Pavonia. Uh, Pavonia is really the kind of largely forgotten community that's really in Jersey City in the community of Communipal today. And it's really the Communipal and Liberty State Park area that this massacre happened in 1643. Yeah, 1643. And then uh, in 1644, uh, the massacre at Pound Ridge, which is in um, uh, lower New York State and Connecticut, uh, really further pushed the peoples away. Um, and uh, today, um, we're really here to celebrate um, this book, uh, which has been um, beautifully produced uh, and also uh, really received uh, rave reviews. Uh, I want to maybe give an introduction to uh, Mary first. Um, so Mary, I, let's bring Mary onto the screen because I want, I want her to be present while we're introducing her. Um, well, hold on. Uh, Mary, hi, welcome. Um, so Mary, um, uh, Mary Rizzo is an associate professor of history at Rutgers University in Newark and a recent recipient of the Faculty Scholar Teacher Award, recognizing her years of work as a scholar and instructor. Uh, she works at the intersection of inclusive public history, digital humanities, urban studies, and 20th century US cultural history. Uh, and uh, she also has written a book called Class Hacks, uh, Young Men and the Rise of Lifestyle. And she's the founder of the Chicory Re Revitalization Project, which, which uses the Black community poetry magazine, uh, Chicory, to spur dialogue on place and identity. Uh, there's a longer uh, biography. If you go to our website, you can read that for all the people involved. And Mary, I mean, this book came out uh, just at the time of, of COVID hitting us. And we were talking early on about wanting to really celebrate, um, but you, um, I think quite respectfully wanted to kind of wait um, and not to in some ways um, uh, intrude um, on the incredible fight um, that especially frontline workers uh, and many of them are students and the families that they come from were really grappling with. So, um, but it's time now, right? It's time to finally celebrate. And thank you for agreeing to do this. Uh, I did want to, just use uh, Arundhati Roy's quote, uh, which uh, if we could bring that onto the screen, it'd be great because I feel it's really relevant uh, to this. Uh, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine the world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers, the Passaic River is one of those dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Um, the reason I want to quote this is that, Mary, I think you're so much a part of going through that portal. So in some ways, this is a good time for us to be really, uh, of course, acknowledging the publication of your work and for you to start talking about it a little bit. But also, um, I'm really excited because the you are in some ways also offering us 
um, a space to raise these questions about what we should be doing. And, um, and then the panel that we're gonna be uh, meeting in a bit and I'll be introducing are really fantastic people from both Baltimore and Newark to help us kind of really discuss this and, and frame it. Um, but uh, if you don't mind, I just want to read one of the strong reviews, one of the many strong reviews that you got. And um, let me just say that this is from the Public Historian, uh, which is a major um, journal, academic journal for those doing public history. And uh, it really ends with these statements. Like all great works of art, Mary Rizzo's book unearths more questions than it answers. It is through the posing of new questions and the interplay of cultural texts and conversation that a new way to see and understand the modern city emerges. Her book implies that if we as scholars and humans can begin to read the divergent parts of the city together, we might imagine what is more equitable, uh, a more equitable city, uh, what a more, excuse me, what a more equitable city might look and sound like. Culture uh, will not save us from neoliberalism, but in, it may be the avenue to the sanity and endurance necessary to build beyond the shared trauma it has caused in Baltimore and cities like it. Um, I'll, I'll mention who wrote that in a second, uh, but uh, I just also wanted to kind of, um, you know, unpack the word neoliberalism a bit, or maybe Mary, if you want, wouldn't mind doing that. It's a term that we in academia use all the time, but oftentimes it's not really understood and just, it's not, it, it's regular folks don't use that word oftentimes. So it'd be good to unpack that because it, it speaks so centrally to what you're looking at and also how Baltimore and New York have been represented. So maybe, so, uh, so Mary, so, we're so delighted to have you here. Um, maybe you'll just begin to say a few words about your book and then we'll go from there. Fantastic, thank you so, so much, Jack. And uh, thank you to everyone at the Price Institute for making this event happen. Um, it's a real honor to be here. And um, and as Jack mentioned, you know, we've been talking about doing this event for a long time and now it felt like uh, the appropriate or a right time to do it. And I'm sorry we can't gather in person, uh, but you know, of course there are affordances that Zoom offers. So um, I do just wanna shout out uh, by name, the folks at the Price Institute. So thank you to Jack, Alex, Claudia, uh, Crystal, Honey, and Randy for doing all of the work to um, make this event happen. And, and thank you to everyone who is um, here on Zoom or on Facebook. Um, really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. And uh, so we'll I'll begin by giving a brief, like a 15 minute uh, uh, talk about my book. So you'll get a little sort of taste of it. Um, and then we will have a, a panel discussion. Uh, and there will be uh, plenty of time for uh, discussion with you all. Um, so please, I hope that you'll have questions for us in thinking about this topic of um, culture uh, and city. So I'm going to share my screen and get started. So, you know, there are many ways that we can talk about the relationship between culture and cities, right? Um, artists have given us indelible images of the cities of their time and place, helping to preserve them for history. So James Joyce once wrote that he quote, wanted to give a picture of Dublin so complete that if the city one day disappeared from the earth, it could be reconstructed out of my book. Um, but perhaps more surprising than artists representing cities in their work is the relationship between um, artists affecting how real cities actually look and are and are planned. Um, so when Norman Bel Geddes, for example, designed the Futurama exhibit for General Motors for the 1939 World's Fair, his depiction of the city of the future was defined by elevated highways between soaring skyscrapers. And that drew from a number of different sources, but especially German filmmaker Fritz Lang's science fiction film, Metropolis. Um, so this is really fascinating to me. So you have a science fiction film about a city that never existed in the real world, then becomes a template for the real cities that we live in and drive through today. Um, so what this says, of course, is that culture affects cities and cities shape culture, which, you know, if I had to boil it down is the most basic premise of my book, Come and Be Shocked, Baltimore Beyond John Waters and the Wire. 
And my book uses Baltimore since the 1950s as a case study to think about the relationship between culture and cities and um, uh, more specifically to be to think about the relationship between um, urban policy and how artists can affect that policy and how those policies have affected artists. Um, I don't have that much time tonight because I really want to get us to the panel. So I'm just going to focus in my talk on a couple of snapshots from Baltimore's history uh, to examine two issues. Um, so first, what is the role of the artist and the cultural creator in the post-industrial city? And secondly, what are the ramifications uh, when we uh, see the arts as an instrument of economic development? And, and particularly, um, I locate this as something that has happened since the 1970s. So let me just say a couple of words uh, about sort of definitions, right? So when we when I say culture here, you know, I'm talking about uh, the arts, um, including the artists uh, themselves, but also the galleries, museums, and other cultural institutions that often we lump together under the sort of rubric of high culture. Um, but I also uh, am talking about popular culture. Um, so I am also in my book and in this talk thinking about things like film production or television shows. So um, the sort of mass media images that we see as well. Um, and what I learned in doing the research for Come and Be Shocked is that these, uh, both the sort of high culture and the popular culture, the galleries and the film productions, create a sort of cultural ecosystem uh, in cities. And in Baltimore, um, very clearly, Baltimore's civic and political leaders have paid attention to this cultural ecosystem uh, to varying degrees since the 1970s. And so you may be wondering why since the 1970s, why locate this uh, time period as the, the sort of uh, fulcrum? So up until World War II, Baltimore's economy was centered on industry, manufacturing, and shipping. So it was the city of Bethlehem Steel and American Can, factories that employed large percentages of the white male population and smaller numbers of people of color. Uh, but by the 1970s, that economy was on life support as a service economy rose instead. And what historians, historians call this deindustrialization, and it profoundly affected Baltimore and other cities like it, cities like Newark, of course. Um, to give you an example, between 1970 and 1995, the Baltimore region lost 90,000 factory jobs. So what kind of jobs did those unemployed people get after that? Um, what happened to those people? Um, and the reality, of course, is that mostly they got jobs in the service industry. Uh, and if they were lucky, and, and maybe if they had some education, they got a job at a university or at a hospital. But if they uh, did not, um, they might have gotten a job cleaning hotel rooms for the burgeoning tourist economy that was um, on its uh, ascendance since the 1970s. And as part of this shift, this economic shift from the industrial to the service industry, um, in Baltimore, especially under its mayor, William Donald Schaefer, who was mayor of Baltimore from 1971 to 1987, um, he really began to work to rebuild the image of, the, of Baltimore to attract new residents, corporate investment, and tourists. And this is where culture comes in. So culture was key to Schaefer's vision of a uh, renewed Baltimore um, in this post-industrial moment. Now, my book details how that process happened um, and how two images of Baltimore have come to exist side by side. So I would say that the two dominant images of Baltimore today are Charm City, which is a sort of white working class eccentric vision of Baltimore. So you might think of sort of a John Waters character like, um, it, like from Hairspray. Um, and that image of Baltimore is located in formerly white ethnic neighborhoods in the city. And this is contrasted with um, what I call and others have called Bodymore, which is a Baltimore, a vision of Baltimore that is populated by black residents who live in poverty and who are and, and are endangered, right? So it is a danger, Bodymore is a dangerous place. And we can think here of the Baltimore of The Wire, for example, but also the real Baltimore of the uh, uprising after Freddie Gray's murder. So briefly tonight, what I would like to do is explore just two snapshots from my book. Um, and in these snapshots, I'm going to really focus on the role of the state in culture, rather than, let's say, the liberatory potential of the arts for activism. And that is definitely a topic I'm interested in and, and a topic that I address in my book um, 
uh, through looking at Chicory, this Black community magazine that was published in Baltimore between 1966 and 1983 as part of the sort of Black arts movement and um, radical Black cultural nationalism. Um, I, I hope that we get to discuss with the panelists um, the possibilities of the arts as a tool for liberation and activism. Um, but here I'm going to focus on a little bit more of like the constraints that artists um, experience. So uh, as I said, I'll be talking about two snapshots from the book. And the first snapshot is about a 1981 public art project in Baltimore that was called The Promenade. And then the second uh, is a debate between David Simon and Mike Rowe over the role of the artist. And that debate took place in 2014. So uh, when Sandy Hillman, uh, the head of the Baltimore Office of Tourism and Promotion under William Donald Schaefer in the 1970s and 1980s, looked out at Baltimore streets she saw places that needed to be enlivened. She described her goal for Baltimore as, quote, animating it. Quote, we began creating animation, creating happenings, turning the city onto itself, using public programming as a means of bringing people back downtown again. And there's a lot to unpack in that sentence, um, but I, I, I want to just sort of focus on the role of the arts in that animation process, because Hillman saw the arts as key to animating Baltimore streets, but only in very particular ways, right? So the arts for her, quote, had special importance for the central city because of the contribution they can make to the attractiveness of the city and therefore to its economic viability. So here we see the yoking together of arts and culture with economics and revitalization in a way that I think becomes very determinative um, in Baltimore um, and I think is applicable to uh, Newark as well and many other places. So, but what does arts mean, right? I mean, the arts can, can mean a lot of different things. So what is Hillman thinking when she's thinking arts? Um, and so she was very clear. She wrote that the arts that um, she, was focused on were, quote, these are her words, common denominator entertainment. Uh, and the goal was to have the arts enliven city streets and events. So what does this look like, right? It looked like, I, I think if you've ever been to any sort of street festival, like anywhere in the country, it sort of looked like that. So it was jugglers and face painters and family-friendly musical acts, right? The idea was to make the streets in bright and colorful and non-threatening um, and to make the city feel playful, like a playful space. Um, but why was animating the streets so important? You know, or maybe there's a better way to say that, which is um, why was controlling how the streets were animated so important to Hillman and therefore the Schaefer uh, regime administration, right? Because let's be clear, right? The streets of Baltimore were not empty. There were people who were using the streets. There was life out on the streets. There were arts and culture happening on the streets of Baltimore. Um, but for Hillman, the people using the streets were not the right people. And the way they were using the streets was not the right ways that were going to help economic redevelopment. And, and I think to understand this, we have to sort of take ourselves back to the, that moment in the 1970s, when if, if people were thinking, people who were not in cities were thinking about animated urban streets, the first images that might come to their mind were actually images from the riots and uprisings that were taking place around the country in the 1960s, from the mid 1960s to the late 1960s. So the images of an animated urban space for many people um, uh, collapsed into uh, news images of riots. Um, so, you know, that I think is the context within which Hillman is trying to uh, push back, right? Um, but even if we look at what local Black Baltimoreans were doing as arts and culture, um, we can see that uh, th this was sort of not uh, acceptable to the Schaefer regime, because again, there was culture and arts happening, um, but it was just deemed inappropriate as animation in this regard. So for example, um, in Baltimore, as many of you I'm sure know, uh, there's a place called the Inner Harbor. It is the sort of central uh, downtown tourist area um, that was redeveloped in the 1970s, formerly a shipping, um, a, a, a port, right? And a, a shipping and manufacturing area that um, was, turned into an area for public events, museums, and consumerism um, through malls and shopping. So uh, in the 19, late 1970s and early 1980s, when uh, William Schaefer went down to the Inner Harbor to see how things were going on, he saw that there were uh, young Black teens who were breakdancing 
in the public areas of the Inner Harbor. Um, so they were playing music and break dancing. And uh, his response to that was to tell the police that they needed to patrol more and make sure that those kids were not doing that anymore. So that was an inappropriate use of uh, public space for the arts, um, according to Schaefer and his uh, administration. So I think the really perfect example to me that came through in my research of this um, connection between control of the streets, animation, and issues around race was the Baltimore Prom Promenade Project in 1981. So in 1981, the city um, raised some money to commission these uh, this married couple of conceptual artists, Helen and Newton Harrison. And the idea is they would create a public arts project in Baltimore that would bring the city together post uh, uprising or post 1968 riots. I'm just gonna read briefly from the book. Uh, the central theoretical conceit of the project was the promenade. The Harrisons argued that a promenade is both, quote, both an activity and a place, a stage on which people in a community meet and mix, end quote. Rather than walking with purpose, this leisurely strolling meant that there was, quote, a high level of amiability and conviviality on the promenade that created a self-regulating ephemeral community that would discourage running, shoving, or behavior that would break the mood. Perhaps most importantly, the, quote, promenade is the only public adventure where you have permission to stare. The promenade aligned perfectly with Schaefer's vision. Art and municipal government could work together to reimagine public space to appeal to visitors and businesses looking to invest in the city. Indeed, the Harrison's project resulted in a series of suggestions for how to connect four areas of Baltimore. The goal was animation. People would become the focal point, drawing other people. Rather than the pointed staring at Divine that John Waters captured while filming her promenades through the city in Pink Flamingos and Female Trouble, this would be warm and friendly. This panoptic gaze of everyone looking at everyone would ensure a safe, comfortable space for the majority. During the inaugural promenade on December 13th, 1981, approximately 200 people, including Mayor Schaefer, quote, followed a handful of pied pipers playing flute and violin music along a trail, sometimes strewn with trash or broken pavement, on a quest for a unified charm city, end quote. Yellow balloons streamed along the route and cheerleaders, unicyclists and jugglers entertained the walkers. A police motorcade, quote, made many of the walkers feel secure in areas where some conceded they might not have wanted to walk by themselves even by daylight, end quote, suggesting that everyday life on those streets simply scared people from outside of those neighborhoods. Who is a city's downtown for? So what we see in this example of the promenade, I think, is how racialized Baltimore City's vision of urban public space and culture was. And that is certainly something that I think is true still today. Um, so for city leaders, Black neighborhoods and the culture of those residents were just simply too scary, right, for the people who they wanted to woo to the city. Um, because the goal was economic redevelopment of the city, as well as image redevelopment, only certain kinds of arts and culture were acceptable. So it was jugglers instead of break dancers and muralists instead of graffiti writers. So let me jump ahead now to 2014 and a public debate between two Baltimore TV figures. Uh, and I'm gonna read a little bit more uh, from the book here. What Baltimore city leaders have learned is that there is no one narrative of a city, even if there is an officially sanctioned one. Writers, filmmakers, poets, and public historians have produced their own stories about place that counter, critique, and at times support that of the civic, city's civic and political elite. Should culture uh, promote positive representations of cities? Whose stories should be told and by whom? These questions were at the heart of a debate that raged between Mike Rowe, Baltimore native, and the former host of the reality TV shows, Somebody's Gotta Do It, and Dirty Jobs, and writer and television producer David Simon in 2014. Rowe argued that Simon's TV dramas Homicide and The Wire, quote, convinced millions of Americans that Baltimore is a fantastic place to buy drugs, find a whore, or get murdered. Better yet, all three at once, end quote. More than statistics or newspaper headlines, he believed these cultural representations determined how people, especially those who have never been there, see Baltimore. What was needed, according to Rowe, were positive representations of regular working people, including those who have been crafting campaigns to make Baltimore, quote, a destination city. Simon responded in a follow-up story by the city paper and a post on his own blog. His work, which chronicles those Baltimore residents whose lives and neighborhoods have been devastated by political policies, had both an artistic and a civic purpose. It could even, quote, help lead to redress and reconsideration of certain policies and priorities, end quote. He argued that the artist must tell stories that make the powerful uncomfortable because, quote, pretty affirming stories 
have a dire social cost for marginalized people with no megaphone of their own. So this snapshot, I think, leads to some uh, some big questions for us, right? What is the role of the artist who works in a city and represents that city in their work? Should they be a critical voice calling out the problems or should they paint a rosy picture that may help to improve the city's image? As the promenade example suggests, cities may much are often much more comfortable with arts that don't challenge people's assumptions or make them consider difficult issues than otherwise. And I think we should also ask what it means for David Simon to be the most powerful cultural producer in and about Baltimore. Again, something that's true today, and may maybe some of you are watching the HBO series that um, he has produced, um, We Own This City, about the Baltimore Corrupt Gun Trace Task Force. So he is certainly a, a, the most powerful person producing images about Baltimore to this day. Um, uh, and certainly the fact that he's a white man has given him access to spaces, to money, to people um, that most uh, most cultural producers or artists in Baltimore uh, are excluded from or never have access to. So whether we agree with his vision of Baltimore or his vision of the artist's civic purpose, we should really understand the privilege that allows him to become one of the most powerful image makers about a black city. So what do we get from these snapshots, right? What are some of the things that I think we can draw from it? Um, so I think, you know, at heart, I think one of the key things from my book and, and one of the key things that I, I think um, is important to think about is the materiality of this. Um, so when we think about arts and culture, often we are thinking, we feel like we're in this very heady abstract world, but there are material consequences for artists when cities see the arts as part of economic development and image making. And let's be clear, um, this can cause increased support for the arts. So some artists might see, might get more money from the city, more funding from the city, um, because the city decides that culture is important. But others uh, might find their ability to tell stories constrained, either implicitly or explicitly, because they rely on funding and support from city agencies or local corporations who want to paint this positive picture. And I think, of course, we also have to think about the unintended consequences of cultural redevelopment on the regular people who live in the city. And the big one, of course, is gentrification, which we will definitely talk about tonight. So um, to wrap up and lead us into our panel discussion, you know, I think uh, we want to also be thinking, though, more perhaps optimistically, right? What are the possibilities for artists and cultural producers working within and around neoliberal policies and the instrumentalization of the arts to imagine new worlds? and new cities. Um, so I really look forward to our panel discussion um, and to your questions. So Jack, I'm gonna uh, turn it back to you to introduce our panelists. Sorry, uh, thank you, Mary. I just had my, okay, I'm back on. Um, thank you. Uh, first, I wanna introduce Nicole King. Uh, who actually is the person who wrote that review uh, that I quoted from. And um, Nicole, when we get to you, I'm gonna introduce everybody. Uh, maybe you could kind of unpack neoliberal since uh, that's a term that's been used. Uh, Nicole King is a, an associate professor and chair of the Department of American Studies, an affiliate professor in the Language, Literacy and Culture doctoral program and director of the Orser Center for the Study of Place, Community and Culture at uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, I'm not gonna read the full uh, bios of everybody. So I'd encourage you to look on our website uh, to, to, to read that. Um, everybody's been involved in multiple ways. So I'd really uh, want you to see the full range of what each person has done. Uh, Fayemi Shakur is a writer, interdisciplinary artist and arts advocate residing in Newark. Uh, she currently, serves as an arts and culture affairs director of the city of Newark. Uh, she has held appointments as visiting lecturer at Rutgers, Newark, Department of Art, Culture and Media, uh, and also uh, serves on the Artist Advisory Council uh, of Newark Arts uh, in 20, 2019. She's also written and directed organizations um, has a long uh, community-based history. Uh, welcome, Fayemi. And uh, Emma Wilcox uh, is a working artist and writer, as well as the co-founder of uh, Gallery of Faro. Uh, over the past decade, she has worked uh, with co-founder Yvonne M. Davis to develop hundreds of exhibitions, residency, residencies, education programs, 
public art initiatives, as well as 22 publications. Um, uh, I, I can go on with, uh, with, with Emma, um, but you get a sense of the kind of huge range that a community-based um, uh, uh, arts uh, center and gallery um, has had in terms of its impact on Newark. And uh, Noelle Lorraine Williams is a graduate of the New School for Social Research and Rutgers University uh, at Newark, we're happy to say, as a public uh, humanities specialist, artist, researcher, and curator. Her work examines the ways African Americans utilize culture to reimagine liberation in the United States. Uh, she has exhibited and lectured at the Newark Museum, the African American Museum in Philadelphia, Jersey City Museum. I can go on and on with, uh, with Noel as well. Uh, so uh, welcome all of you. I'm really glad you could be joining us. And uh, this is really a, a fantastic kind of dream group um, that, that Mary immediately thought of. Um, so we're gonna begin, uh, if it's okay, um, with Nicole and uh, maybe you could explain and unpack the term neoliberal a little bit in terms of how it applies to the arts and culture. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to Mary, thank you to Jack, thank you to the Price Institute, and thank you everyone for showing up. Um, and while I dislike neoliberalism, I do enjoy talking about it and, and kind of breaking it down. Um, I have an edited collection where Mary has a piece in called Baltimore Revisited Stories of Inequality and Resistance in a U.S. City. And when we were workshopping the introduction, I kept taking it to my undergrads and being like, does this make sense? Um, because it really is a complex term and it means lots of things, but boiling it down, I think really it is the, privat the privatization of public good. So we see everything, you know, public education, you know, access to arts, access to housing, all should be based in a capitalist format where it places competition as the main model for us to succeed and compete. And I think, you know, the arts have been utilized in the, that whole kind of neoliberal idea because art is about beauty, it's about humanity, it's about what makes us human beings and connect with other human beings. Um, but one of the things that the neoliberal state does is it, it monetizes it um, and makes, and kind of flattens those really human parts about it. You see this in, in Baltimore, a lot of controversy surrounding arts districts or um, the segregation or siloing of the arts community. Um, equity and access to funding for arts is certainly based on that kind of neoliberal model where you have to understand the bureaucracy of like a thousand cuts to get a $5,000 grant. Um, and everyone's competing for the same $5,000 grant. So neighborhoods are going against other neighborhoods. So I, those are just some ways where I think neoliberalism really fits into a, a discussion of the arts. And I, I see a lot of nodding and I'm sure those of you who work in arts organizations can speak very much to that. So. I'll, I'll let you do so now. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, so, um, so I just wanna turn it back to Mary and Mary, um, Mary has a series of questions um, that will really lead you into a conversation. That's really our goal is to have a conversation. So back to you, Mary. Thank you so much, Jack, and thank you so much, Nicole, for your uh, uh, your definition of neoliberalism. That that was great, super super helpful. So um, I, I have some questions to get us started, um, but we really do want this to be an informal conversation. So please, you know, ask each other questions, um, jump off on what other topics seem really of interest and importance to you right now. And I'll also say to folks who are watching online, if you have questions, which we really want you to have questions, we're going to get to those um, in a little bit. Please put your questions in the chat. Um, and uh, if you're on Facebook, you can put your questions on Facebook and they'll be pasted over into the Zoom chat. So we should be able to uh, see them. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible. So. Um, Let's start with a sort of broad question, which will just get each of you talking about sort of your perspective and your vantage point from where you are. Um, so what's the most important issue to you right now from your perspective when we think about this issue of the relationship between culture or art and cities? Um, and has that changed over time? So I, I, I'm big, I think all of you um, have been... Uh, residents and um, workers in either Baltimore or Newark for a long period of time. So um, what's the most important issue now, right now, about culture and cities, the arts and cities uh, from where you stand? And has that changed? Um, and how might that have changed? So whoever wants to jump in first, um, we can just kind of go from there. Yeah. 
I see you have your um your 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 unmuted Emma if you want to start us off or <laughs> I I didn't want to be that person. Um I I suspect anything that I might say because who I'm in this room with I I keep thinking of moments that happened in public settings, public meetings, conferences. Um, they're all very social memories. So, um, Noel or Fiamme, if you were there, uh, part of what's interesting about memory is how it's um, individual and um, collective at once. Um, so, I, I think the most important issue is this pressing need to have an honest, nuanced, and respectful conversation about resources. And I know that sounds rather basic, but um, in my experience, it rarely happens. If an arts district is being talked about, usually the last people to be brought into the room, if they're ever brought into the room, are artists and um, artist run spaces and those kinds of culture workers. Um, so the relationship between talking about um, the sort of abstraction of um, what's called placemaking and the actual um, financial and legal um, and social resources necessary to realize that kind of vision, there, there's always this kind of disconnect. So I have this really indelible memory um, of a conference. Um, that uh, was ostensibly about um, historic reuse. And it's an intergenerational memory also because it was a Wells Fargo administrator sort of nostalgically badgering the younger people in the room about their um, failure to homestead um, underutilized properties in communities like Newark. And uh, he was uh, weighing in about how we could just, you know, um, get our two hands together and um, reimagine these buildings. And I got up and asked him when was the last time he had touched a crowbar? Um, because there's this reference to this kind of revolutionary rhetoric um, and these moments that usually are from the late 20th century, but there's a sort of um, a failure to talk about what resources may have shifted or changed or become available since then. Um, whether it's the CETA funding that ran from 74 to 81, that got City Without Walls started here in Newark, um, or um, the housing crash of the mid 2000s that wiped out a lot of progressive foundations. Um, there, there's always resources in flux. So um, as unsexy as it may sound, I just wish that we could have more honest conversations with artists and people doing the work about money. Um, and for me, the, the simplest way that I can talk about that is, is just to say, when's the last time you picked up a crowbar? When is the last time you actually had someone come to your door and say that where you were living was not zoned for residential use? because the work that we do isn't an abstraction. It has a touch and a feel and a smell and a sound, but it tends to be talked about in this incredibly abstracted way. Okay, I guess I'll jump in. Um, you know, money is, has always been an issue and I think it is the biggest issue is funding. Um, here in New Jersey, it seems we have limited funding streams for the arts that many organizations are competing for. And um, there are so many different types of organizations that don't qualify because they're um, nonprofit or, or rather because they're LLCs. And one thing that came out of the pandemic, you know, and I just came on in 2020, I worked in the artist community myself for 20 years as an artist and an arts administrator. So I feel like, you know, this is my family. And so when the mayor approached me um, to join the administration and serve as the city's um, director of arts and cultural affairs, I, I didn't immediately say yes, to be honest. It was a heavy choice to make, but at the end of the day, my arts community needed this. 
And we're really fortunate here in Newark, unlike other cities, because our mayor is an artist. So um, regarding that issue of funding, he knew immediately an arts fund was necessary, specifically for small to mid-sized art organizations. And it's not enough, but it's a, it's a start. And you know, we don't we can't take all of the credit for these policies that we're now trying to enact. It really was our local art agency, Newark Arts, who developed a cultural plan for the city of Newark and identified, you know, areas that needed our attention. And the mayor listened and responded. And some of those issues were the need for space, the need uh, for more funding, the need for uh, more coordination, having a point person in City Hall that could serve as a liaison, which is where I came in, and also the development of a cultural trust. And um, all of those things are, are real issues, in addition to affordable housing. Yes, I mean, I believe, thank you, Fayemi and Emma, um, both of who I've known for several years uh, now and engage with in different ways including some very um, timely um, exhibitions. <laughs> um, and so I think there are just, you know, there are just so many issues um, for me when I think of arts and culture in urban spaces that I'm just kind of overwhelmed. Um, I'm not quite sure which one to um, kind of highlight, right? Um, whether it's how people understand the arts, right? So when people kind of like prioritize fine artists and they don't look at um, like folk arts, you know, like say like hair braiding, um, street dancing, um, things like that, which we saw an explosion of during COVID, right? So we saw that the dances that Black youth were creating in places like Newark and Brooklyn and the West Coast, all of a sudden were being done by um, white women, white men, a diversity of folks all around the world, literally. Um, and we actually saw some of the youth talking back last year about their culture, right, being being absorbed. Um, like Fiami noted, we're also talking about housing um, and we're talking about opportunities to live in um, um, like decent places to create. Um, sometimes as artists, you know, um, in order for me to create, I lived in an illegal apartment for about 10 years um, so that I could have money for materials, you know. Um, then we're also, you know, but then I've also been on the other side um, because I was also a part of philanthropy. I've worked at a women's foundation um, and I've also applied for grants, right? So I've seen um, desperation on both sides. I've been desperate. I've seen other people's desperation. I've seen the rewards of funding and how things blossom. Um, I see various opportunities. And then something that I've been just obsessed with since I was about four years old is just understanding my community. I was born in um, downtown Jersey City, and then I moved up, we moved up the hill um, in Jersey City. I would often go by like a playground that were reimagined by liberals. Um, and, you know, they, I think I, Alex was there, we discussed this on another panel, and I would see like these tires that were <laughs> um, housing gardens and other things um, that were well-meaning, but then I was like, oh, that's not beautiful to me. And then I also wondered about other kinds of spaces, right? And then we moved over here to Newark, um, 20, you know, I moved over to 19th Avenue and 21st Street. And I got to see more of the environment. So for me, um, you know, and then just coming through Newark, 
from down from Jersey City coming up through Springfield Avenue all the way up to Ivy Hill, right? So I had the opportunity to see different kinds of ways that the cities could be. And, and, I, and I remember being seven years old and wondering why did things look this way, right? So for those of us who actually do kind of um, live in the urban space and have developed as cultural creators people who give opportunities, people who receive opportunities. I think there are just so many different um, things to engage in, to think about. So it becomes a very complex conversation that really doesn't always have these kind of um, polar, polarized sides. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I definitely agree with that. I always think too that in Newark, um, particularly, there's something very unique about this city. It has a soul. Um, it's not, you, you know, we're, we're at a, a tipping point, a, a very fine, you know, a, a, a area where we have to pay, almost be hyper-focused and super intentional about how we move forward now. But I think, the Baraka family, Amiri and Amina Baraka, modeled the best of the arts and what cultural workers can do in a city. Um, in their own home, starting Kamako's Blues People and places like Spirit House. And, you know, it's a legacy that lives on today. And I don't feel like in this city we separate arts from activism. I'm always reminded of, you know, Nina Simone when she says, you know, how can you be an artist and not reflect the times? And I think many of our artists in this community do that. And, you know, we've, you know, before, you know, the G word even popped up, we had an arts festival here in our city for the past 20 years. So it's not a new thing for us. We are a predominantly black and brown city. Um, we have uh, economic development, yes, it, it's definitely connected. The arts and economic development is connected, but I think at least in Newark, we see it beyond that as improving our quality of life. I've had the opportunity to work on so many projects like the Lincoln Park Music Festival, which helped revitalize that area um, and it's still in need of revitalization. But I noticed that when we started that festival, um, prostitution and open drug sales decreased in that area. And City Without Walls was there. And all of that cultural activity that was going on did add some vibrancy to that neighborhood. And then when City Without Walls closed, I was heartbroken. And I've seen many others, you know, other spaces close. And it is truly heart heartbreaking. And so at this point, you know, um, the mayor, uh, his policy that he wants to enact to help preserve some of these spaces is providing a pathway to ownership. Because part of the problem is many organizations and artists don't own their spaces. And so through a new arts initiative, an art space initiative, he wants to provide property, city owned properties for a dollar per year to lease with a pathway to ownership. And, you know, it's things like that, being intentional about providing uh, sustainable policies to help uplift and um, build on the capacity of our arts organizations so that they can survive and thrive. But I don't oppose the idea of the arts being able to revitalize communities. It's a, it's a benefit, but it's all in how you do it. So we, we already have a question um, uh, that um, actually dovetails exactly a question from Abe Breswitz, which dovetails exactly with the question that uh, we've uh, already begun talking about a little bit. So um, so maybe I'll, I'll pose that question, which is about the G word gentrification. Right. So. Um, 
I think a lot of people, well, I live in Newark, right? And I'll, I'll say for sure, a lot of people in Newark are very concerned about gentrification. And my students are like really concerned. You know, they, they're they young and, and they talk about how they've seen the city of Newark change so dramatically that it doesn't feel like the city that they grew up in, which is really interesting um, to hear. Um, and, and certainly, you know, there's similar processes that are happening in Baltimore and many, many other places. Um, and when we look at gentrification um, from the scholarly point of view, you know, there are scholars and Sharon Zukin is always like, you know, sort of my my North Star on this because I think she's just so brilliant um, uh, that uh, arts and culture um, are often linked to processes of gentrification, in part because um, uh, arts the arts infrastructure, galleries, artists have a cachet, have a cultural capital that um, then uh, is able to draw wealthier people to those areas who want to participate in that cultural capital. And then we all know the process, right? Then it becomes unsustainable as rents go up and people are forced out. So Soho, of course, in New York is like one of the paradigmatic places where the arts uh, and gentrification has made it literally impossible for almost anybody to live there unless they're fabulously wealthy. So what do we do about that, right? Um, are the arts and culture inextricably linked with gentrification? I mean, you, sort, you started to sort of address some of this a little bit. You know, is there a way that we can separate um, uh, a support for the arts and branding, if we want to use that term, branding a city as an arts city without having it then seem to inextricably lead to the displacement of um, the artists themselves, the galleries, and then, of course, uh, regular working folks who also live in those neighborhoods. So, yeah, love to hear your thoughts um, about that that question. And, and thank you, Abe, for, for bringing that issue up. I think it's terrifying. Um, I'm honestly yeah. scared and um, I don't have all of the answers. And that's why, you know, what Emma was talking about, about having open conversations is really important so we can engage in more community building and listening and addressing some of these things collaboratively. Um, but I, I do have to acknowledge like gentrification is an issue nationally, right? And in some ways it's so scary because it seems um, almost inevitable because we're talking about land that is privately owned and cities don't necessarily have very much control over what private landowners and developers do with their space. And I think our mayor is, uh, and our administration is working through some of that by creating things like a land bank um, and having opportunities that residents can benefit from some of these properties. But as some of you probably already know, a report recently came out that um, done by Rutgers Newark, thank goodness, um, who's also a part of our equi equitable uh, growth commission, that really highlighted the fact that these corporations are buying up homes that were really supposed to be for residents. And they're taking away, taking away the opportunity. And so this issue of gentrification doesn't just affect artists, of course. It affects every resident in our city. And I agree with Abe that it's not just about affordable housing, but it's about lower income housing. And I do applaud the mayor for the fact that he did at least set up some incentives that required developers to have affordable a certain number of affordable or a certain percentage of affordable housing in their um, new developments that they're proposing. But is it enough? I think we're learning um, every day and we have to continue the conversations and, and people should not be afraid to speak to the city and come to council meetings and voice their opinions. There, It's such a, a balancing act and um, it's difficult to be honest. I really appreciate um, just the words that are kind of um, in, in use this evening talking about 
um, you know, Noel, when you were talking about living someplace that was illegal, like I, I want us to talk about legal and illegal and quasi legal and grandfathered in and gray zone. I, I want um, that kind of language to be really in really free use this evening, because again, it's about those details, the actual circumstances, the conditions, the stories, the like extreme local specificity of where the art gets made, gets experienced. Um, who are the people that make it? Who are the people that mentored them? Who are they mentoring? I'm, I'm into like extreme specificity as an act of sort of love and resistance. Um, and also, um, Fiamma, you were talking about inevitability. And this is the great lie of capitalism is um, not only that it's inevitable, but that um, unfettered market forces are somehow um, natural and um, inevitable and kind of organic. Um, and more so if you object to them and um, say that things could be a different way, um, you usually are accused of being um, unreasonable and, and childish in some way. You're, you're interfering with, with the natural order of things. So, um, you know, the idea of what's inevitable and trying to imagine different scenarios is really, really powerful, but um, I'm scared too. I didn't want Gallery of Pharaoh to be the oldest artist run space currently operating. Um, I'm proud that we're that old, but I never wanted that. Um, what drew us to this city amongst other things was that incredible history of arts and activism and the tradition of artists run spaces of artists making things happen. Um, and um, open doors, which is what the festival was called originally. It's really important. And again, it's this kind of loving act for me to talk about how it originated with artists opening their spaces because those spaces were sometimes gray zone or illegal. And so our arts festival isn't a kind of artificial graft onto a city in an effort to rebrand. It, it was something that came out of this really um, rich tradition, um, but there's a lot at stake here. But um, unfettered market forces are not any more uh, organic than um, you know subsidizing the arts is no more artificial than say a 30 year tax abatement for a commercial hockey arena. You know, it's all a choice. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it's, I, again, there are just so, so many ideas that are just so important and so many feelings, um, emotions. What is it saying? Uh, emotions are artifacts too, right? Um, thinking about Newark and thinking about Jersey City, um, environments where artists have really um, provided the resources and become leaders in their communities where, you know, the cities, Jersey City and Newark mainly had the opportunity to actually benefit from these artists created communities. Um, and again, um, and I think sometimes that's where the, sometimes there's some confusions. Like even if we look at some place like Emma um, spoke about Newark Open Doors, um, but even if we think about Groove on Grove, you know, um, that's in Jersey City by Grove Street. That was something that, um, what is her name? Olga created for artists to, to um, be in the space of Grove Street. And now the Jersey City runs it, right? As a service to um, the, Jeff the folks who are now paying um, $3,000, $4,000, $5,000 in rent, right? So I think sometimes um again i don't I, I didn't know this theme was going to emerge for me out of this conversation but it's just um it becomes very like merge because um like even when Fiami was speaking she brought up amiri baraka um and the influence of the black arts and um i lived in as i said i lived in jersey city and then we moved to newark and i remember when my mom was alive um rest in peace um, when she would talk about like my cousin Jella and Lloyd Henry, he used to spend a lot of time with Baraka. And my mom used to like sew the outfits for their theater performances, right? So my mom, um, she would always talk about how she would be up for three days, like sewing the outfits, right? For their performances. 
And I remember this would come up, you know, this, this idea became so clear to me when I was applying for something. And I saw that, you know, they were providing funds, you know, for like public outdoor performances, right? So the way that the economics break down in places like um, Newark and in Baltimore, I, um, you know, Mary's um, worked on the Chicory project, right, is that we do have these low and working class income folks who are often funding um, these projects. My mom would spend time, my cousins would buy the fabric, you know, and, it, you know, they would create these spaces. So it's about these economics, right, and who's paying um, and these opportunities. So um, it's just, it's just so many things that are just coming up tonight. Um, and then when we think about spaces, and I, and, you know, I want to bring club culture into this, because that's a part of Newark culture, right? House music culture, and creating um, spaces for, for dancing, right? For folks who are promoters who can get up the money to rent a space, <laughs> you know, it's that same thing that's, that there's something very particular about the Black, um, Latino, urban experience that um and with economics and being in between these spaces that um it's it's challenging to unpack because you're dancing with so many devils you know Yeah, I wanted to um, speak about gentrification and in the context of Baltimore too, because I, I'm interested in how that it fits and doesn't fit with Newark in, in the context of what Mary was talking about. Because we started, um, well, I think you need to define what you mean by gentrification because people mean different things. Some people use it a positive term, some very, very negative. Some people are like, I want 10% more gentrification here. And for me, when I talk to students, I'm like gentrification and how we define it scholarly oftentimes it includes displacement. So, you know, removing poor and working class black and brown people from their homes to bring in other things. And artists sometimes are like the shock troops that come and prepare for the next level of gentrification. And then we have like hyper gentrification in cities like New York or San Francisco, very different cities than Baltimore or, New or Newark, though I, I know Newark less. But one of the things that I was, I was uh, when I had this project, Baltimore Traces, Communities in Transition, and we interview people in arts districts and public markets about how the neighborhood changes. And I don't allow students to use the word gentrification unless someone else brings it up. And I say, ask them to define what they mean. Because I think in our conversations, we have to be speaking the same language to a certain degree to be able to, to, to come together and think about solution-oriented ways to think about ways to get rid of displacement, displacing people from their homes, bad. No one likes that. Um, I mean, some people maybe do like the evil mustache people. Um, but one of the things that I think about Baltimore and I was working on a project and I was calling it the ungentrifiable city. Because a lot of the worries in Baltimore for, you know, Southwest Baltimore, which was called Suibo and has this Suibo festival, it was going to gentrify back in the 70s and 80s. And it did not in the ways that we typically think about gentrification, like Mary was talking about, like the Inner Harbor. And our arts district started in, in the beginning of the 20th century and uh, the 21st century, excuse me, and, and Station North in the north part of the city and also in the east part, Highland Town um, area were the two first arts districts. And really Station North, I was walking by there, you know, and it really wasn't, it was pre-pandemic. So many things that opened have now closed great art spaces in the area. There's still some there, it's still, you know, and, and, and really a lot of what I see is this resistance to gentrification. It's not a failure. It is something that we're not seeing in the people of Baltimore, the people that will fight to stay in their homes, the people that will, will use tactics to fight eminent domain or other things. It's this, this real kind of like grassroots movement that comes from and coincides with the arts. And our first um, arts district that was in a black neighborhood um, wasn't until 2019, and that was the Pennsylvania Avenue one. And I really think when we think about what, what could arts look like without gentrification, we have to look at history and Pennsylvania Avenue itself was uh, a black arts district and was connected to, to segregation. And what destroyed it was the highway to nowhere and other kind of urban renewal processes. But the issue of gentrification is really a complicated one 
And I think a lot of times when we think about when I we did our first project in Station North and we were talking to, to people about the neighborhood changing, I thought it was all going to be about gentrification. And then it became about policing, because that's what comes along with this as well, is this violence. This, and I can see it because they're redoing Lexington Market. And I live in an arts district. I'm in the Bromo Arts and Entertainment District in the West Side. And that's a map of it back there that my students did. But one of the things when you talk to people on the ground, doing oral history, doing interviews, making podcasts, you're talking about arts districts and they start talking about policing because that's the thing that comes along with it in cities like Baltimore and pushing people out and using these other tactics of public safety, which I see as like the fast violence. And we've got this slow violence of, of development going on uh, that Mary's book speaks to a lot. So it's such a complicated and rich, rich um, issue. And I've enjoyed hearing more about it in Newark. So, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I want to jump in, Nicole, on the point that you're making uh, about policing, but also I want to say, um, you know, Nicole has been working with folks uh, in Baltimore, speaking about displacement, um, to uh, work with um, folks in a neighborhood called Poppleton, where folks are, are literally being displaced from their homes right now. Yes. So um, I, I, it's organized Poppleton. If people Google that, they'll find it, right, No, Nicole? Um, so folks want to, it's, it's just an egregious story. Like if you thought like that was something that, that doesn't happen anymore, like it's just, it's awful uh, and egregious and, um, and it, anyway, so please read about Poppleton and, and get involved, um, um, through petitions and letters, but I do want to jump in on the issue of policing and like, maybe pull us a little bit away from like the arts specifically in terms of the way we've been thinking about it as like arts and often galleries and things like that. And thinking more about kind of culture and image, which is obviously so, so much of what I'm thinking about in, in the book. So I always want to talk a little bit about where I live in the Ironbound in Newark, which for those of you who are not familiar with it, it is a predominantly immigrant neighborhood, um, had uh, long been settled by Portuguese and Brazilian immigrants now increasingly, um, Latin American. American. Um, and it is definitely gentrifying, or we should say there are a lot of, there's a lot of development happening in the neighborhood, including across the street from me, there's like a 13 story uh, apartment building being built. Um, and um, on lots of different kinds of developments and lots of folks who are moving in and prices are going up very, very fast. But what I want to, uh, the reason why I bring it up is, um, the Ironbound is sold as a sort of Newark, what do they call it? Live, work, play neighborhood. So you'll see like when you drive into Newark on Route 21, there's like a big billboard that says that like the Ironbound, come play in the Ironbound. And, and you have two like white presenting people who are on this giant billboard having dinner at a nice like restaurant or there's like a flamenco dancer or something like that. Um, and so very much that image is being used to brand this neighborhood and then also to brand Newark as a city. And that's very much about distinguishing the Ironbound from uh, Newark, which is a predominantly black city, right? So there's clearly a distinction being made. This is like a long way, all a long way to say that one of the things that concerns me about the fast violence is um, a few months ago, not that long ago, um, there was a, a proposal to criminalize giving homeless people food uh, in Newark. And it was focused on this park, this very small park that's very near where I live, that's right outside of Newark Penn Station, where there are a lot of homeless folks who uh, hang out there. And um, there are a lot of church groups that come by and give people food. And so there was this proposal to, to criminalize it. And one of the things that I thought was really fascinating was that um, the uh, so some of the supporters of this proposal were folks who were associated with the Ironbound Business District, and um, clearly, it's it to me analyzing what they're saying about this. This is all about trying to um, create and maintain or control a specific image of this neighborhood that is for people who are coming in on the train who might be going to one of those restaurants who they do not want to see homeless people or litter or whatever um, on the streets. And so, so far, I will say that there have not been, as far as we can tell, this has not been enforced in any way. So people are still uh, allowed to congregate there. People are still um, being given food. Um, but to me, it was really uh, indicative of a sort of cultural aspect to this, so like less arts focus, but more about the culture of a place and the image of a place, and then its um, association with state violence, um, or in this case, the criminalization of some like this very humane act of giving someone who needs food food. So, you know, I think I just wanted to raise that as like another thing that I've seen in a place like Newark um, that really troubles me, and I think is related like to very many of the issues that we're talking about here. 
Yeah, um, I agree that, you know, when we're talking about culture, it definitely is not limited to just galleries and artists, you know, and this is absolutely a city that has a culture of activism. Um, our, our residents are very aware, very vocal, and they do vote and they do voice their opinions. And I think that comes out of our culture of activism. But I think we try and utilize art and culture in this city in a different way, um, almost through a type of storytelling and representation. In front of City Hall, we have a statue of George Floyd mm -hmm. and a statue of our first Black mayor, uh, Kenneth Gibson. And you know things like that would not happen without a mayor like uh, Raz Baraka. And I, I don't think that's a small thing when we look around at other um, cities who are still debating whether or not they should have Confederate era monuments. Mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to do when we do things like that, including of the project we're working on around Har the Harriet Tubman monument we're building is being a part of making sure our own residents and children know their history and can see themselves in liberation struggle and activism and uh, civil and human rights. Um, this type of storytelling and history is important to preserve. So it's not all about uh, Gal uh, galleries. It's about the history, the soul, the culture of a place. And as far as policing, you know, in every area, cities can improve, including our own. Um, but I am extremely excited about the Office of Violence Prevention and our homelessness czar, you know, that are working to, um, we worked with an artist who actually designed um, we had some container homes mm -hmm. and artists came in and painted and designed and beautified those spaces. And even went as, as far as to put affirmations on pillowcases that said, I am worthy. Um, I am safe. Mm -hmm. I am worthy of the things I say I want. And we wanted to create, and you know, that's what art does. It's, it's more than just economic development. And that's our city's approach to engaging artists and the arts and culture um, in our city. And again, to emphasize, and thank you, Fayemi, it's, it's, it's so often, and I think this is what makes these debates so challenging in the public sphere, is that you can have a community grassroots group in Newark uh, pre-Black Lives Matter demanding for the mayor to put more police on their block, right? Mm -hmm. And they could be Black and they could be poor and they could be asking for more police on the block, right? What happened during Black Lives Matter is that a term that traditionally left-wing Black activists <laughs> used a lot uh, called police brutality, um, hit went viral and all of a sudden Americans were using that term to identify an issue that folks could gather around right but as far as the amount of police and communities we have as many um, low income and poor folks asking for police right as you know other folks, you know, asking for police, you know, um, when we think about like the homelessness issue, um, like Mary, I, li I live a couple of blocks from Mary, you know, um, and I have a problem with homelessness. I have a problem with folks being um, outside the train station. And there's a woman who's been living in the park um, for three years now, um, and she's amassing garbage on the corner. And um, you know, at first I felt bad for her, but then I started to wonder, you know, what exactly, because I make the decision to stay in an urban space and because I make the decision to be in these spaces um, and I don't choose to go live in the suburbs and have people police the boundaries, right, is what happens once we go outside of Newark. Um, you go to places like Montclair and other places where there are police literally 
you know, stopping um, folks. So I choose to live in an urban sphere. So does that mean that um, I need to like um, live somewhere where, you know, there's urine and feces and people like with garbage? What does that mean for, for other folks too? So I think it's, I think it's a complicated issue and I rarely go into this complicated space. I don't know why today, Thursday, I'm deciding to go because I'm that's usually not my space. But I think it's important for us to understand that there are there's all of these different issues are kind of laying over each other. I think usually what helps me to stay clear though is autonomy, right? Understanding autonomy. So so if we're looking at, you know, someone who's poor asking for more police, where, how do we, how do we um, understand the integrity and the autonomy of that person and of that community? If we're going to see, have this homeless woman in the park, what is her integrity? What's her autonomy? What's my integrity? What's my autonomy? What do we demand of a public space? What do we need? Um, for all of us that share a community, what does that all mean, you know? So I think um, this issue of autonomy is one way to kind of lead us um, through these very challenging conversations and um, like what, and, and, and the place to, and the opportunity to be free and the opportunity to be happy and to be in a clean space, you know? So um, yeah, I just wanted to, to bring that in. I'll just say, you know, I'll just really quickly. I mean, you know, I used to live in downtown Newark. And for those of you who are not familiar with Newark, there's the Prudential Arena, which is, you know, the huge sports concert venue or whatever. I lived like literally in front of it. Like it was like right around the corner. And here's what, what would drive me crazy is that um, when there is an event at the Prudential Arena, the police make sure all of the streets are shut down so people can walk. So people from outside of Newark can come into the train station and walk safely quote unquote or feel safe mm -hmm. or whatever to um the arena and then back again so like as someone who lived there and drove a car and stuff like it was a disaster for me because like i literally couldn't get to my parking garage right but but and 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 if, if i think my partner is watching this right he'll know i complain about this all the time there was one day where some group of drunk suburbanites right who are coming from the arena um there are these giant planters on the sidewalk and they took someone took a plant out of every one of those planters and threw it on the ground Right. Yeah. And it's like, I, I like, like my head almost exploded. Right. But it was the same thing. It's like, there was plenty of, of garbage and detritus and like, you know, whatever that gets left behind, but guess what? The city, I assume pays people to clean it up. And so that's, that's the, I guess the, the thing that I would, I would say too, is that, you know, we are also making, uh, the city is making decisions about how to utilize its resources. And so it's very open to utilizing all of its, or a lot of resources to making sure that the prudential area stays clean, even if people mm. are like ripping plants and throwing them on the ground and beer bottles and all of that. Um, so why can't we do the same thing in um, a park and uh, making sure that litter is picked up afterwards? So, you know, that would be the thing I, I think is the question to ask ourselves is about resources. And I saw uh, Nicole also put in the chat about Baltimore's police budget, which is, if I'm not mistaken, half a billion dollars. Um, so, you know, it's like more resources to that. I don't I don't know. That seems that's like a lot. <laughs> It's really so. interesting for me being on the inside now, working in local government when I was once on the outside, and I see things from both sides. And, I'll, and it's interesting because I know that certain things are happening, but residents and community aren't aware of those things. And how can we better communicate? Um, with each other about these shared concerns. Um, I don't know. Abe is in the chat going off. I, I want to recruit him yeah. to come work for the city because he is like one point. Yeah, um, <laughs> he's on fire, and I really, you know, all of his comments. You know, I, I don't disagree with anything that he's saying. Um, so a lot of those things aren't my area of expertise, to be honest. Um, but I do think that when it comes to downtown, when I look at other cities, um, downtowns, Philadelphia, Chicago, 
you know, Atlanta, LA, wherever, we are still dealing with a great deal of blight and vacant land and, you know, uh, white flight um, and developers that have held on to these properties for years, waiting for the right moment, waiting for the moment when they could profit um, has been a huge problem. And again, you know, the city doesn't own those spaces. And so the challenge is definitely figuring out how not to cave and give in to the to whatever whims they put upon us, but how to create a more collaborative and equitable city. We're always in conversation about that. Emma, I think you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I mean, there's just so much so much to unpack here. There's just so many details and stories and memories and evocative language. You know, um, Mary, you talked about images. Um, in my own work as an artist, I work with language a lot. I kind of collect it. Um, and I'm just thinking about um, the way that um, sort of um, these, these phrases um, get, get worn down. And so the, the layers of um, detail and the ways in which like more specific stories contradict the sort of standard narrative. I, I always uh, worry about the details getting sort of lost. Um, and um, a really uh, nice uh, newspaper clipping that I have in my sketchbook as an artist comes from the Star Ledger. And I just happen to note the way that what is now known as the Audible Innovation Cathedral was described, where it's this very um, incredibly excessively concise narrative with all of the sort of um, details and, and Newark specificity sanded down, where um, this narrative has uh, a, a corporation heroically coming in and rescuing an abandoned building. And I was like, wait a minute, um, there was this whole late 20th century period where it was the Wisdom Mansion, but it was it made for an easier story. Um, that's Women in Support of Million Man March. Um, it made for an easier story just to kind of sand down the details um, and reduce it to this, this simplistic idea of the sort of abandoned church then being brought into this, this new creative reimagining. Um, and I love that we're all talking about this tiny park in the Ironbound. Uh, you probably could write a dissertation and all of the, the um, strange interplay of um, the idea of public art, the idea of safety and what public spaces should look and feel and smell like, um, because there's two um, uh, monuments slash pieces of public art and they don't seem to be in conversation with each other at all. And one of them started being use it, used as a civic resource by the homeless people because it had a water feature. Um, it's a war memorial. It was then surrounded by gates to prevent anyone from engaging with it. So it was public art that had to be protected from the public. Um, and also jumping back a few beats to the um, Ironbound Business Association, the um, Come, Come uh, Play and the Ironbound, something that I noticed just as um, more with my artist hat on even than my gallery owner hat, I happened to notice that the gallery where this fictionalized couple is ending their delightful evening of play in the Ironbound, the gallery where they end their romantic evening is not actually physically located within the Ironbound's neighborhood limits. The footage comes from Algyra, so that's in a different neighborhood in downtown in sort of the non-Ironbound part of Newark. And that is a gallery that has since closed. So there's a lot going on in that video in terms of thinking about the image of a city, the actual specifics of art and where art gets made. And it just gets weirder every time I look at it. Um, but these unbelievably like provincial level details that inform my day-to-day -day life, I mean, all of them are kind of fascinating as symbols because they're, they're complicated stories and their level of detail. Um, and probably will continue to evolve and just gain meaning and weirdness over time. 
I think what I hope, my hope is that artists will feel empowered to engage in public spaces and public art and submit proposals and themes that speak more to the residents who are here today. A, a Call to Peace was the exhibition where I first met Mary and we were talking about um, what is a timely monument for Newark. And that was in partnership with the national organization Monument Lab. And we had this little shipping container where people came in and they submitted their proposals for what types of new statues and monuments they wanted to see. It was all ages, all types of people that came. Um, some people really just wanted to see families that looked like them. And, you know, it's it's a really, I think, ripe time for artists and art organizations to be to feel empowered and feel like they can um, submit proposals and share their ideas because there's an administration that wants that. And it's not an administration that has this view of uh, some sort of commercial or corporate way of using the arts to benefit economic development. It's a real respect for what art and culture bring to our lives. So maybe that's a good segue to, to a question um, that came through on Facebook. And there have been a lot of questions posed in the chat, so I apologize because we're certainly not going to get to all of them. But this question from Paul Dennison. Um, so Paul asks, how do you include multiple artistic voices and points of view as part of the conversation to showcase a complete view of culture within cities and provide full access to economic opportunity? Um, so I think, Femi, you know, you're sort of beginning to, to discuss that a little bit, So, um, but wanted to open it up to other folks as well. So how do you include these multiple artistic voices and points of view? Uh, how do you do that to showcase a complete view or a more complete view? And then how do you provide... Um, access to economic opportunity? Well, you know, fortunately we have Newark Arts and, um, you know, I don't, I don't think people always realize that they can reach out and submit proposals and share their ideas. Um, there's no wall or barrier preventing anyone from doing that. And another thing my office is working on is a public RFP. Um, for, uh, for public art and, you know, having open calls for public art proposals. Some of them themed, but some of them just open. And I, I just encourage artists and art organizations to know that they can always um, come to the city or even to our local art agency, Newark Arts, and, and talk about what they wanna see in the city. That door is always open. I'm just going to keep talking about this idea that the details matter. I think we exist at present in a kind of national culture where um, people who are seen as thought leaders, you know, are, are ascribed this power to stay on the, the 500 foot view. And I actually think the people who um, really get things done, again, it's, it's focusing on the details and, and getting the work done. Um, you know, I'm, that's, that's the team I root for is, is the idea of being close to the ground. I think that's where you have the clearest vision. Um, so um, really digging into the structural barriers, the, the details, the, um, the need to update and adapt um, zoning and work creatively to adapt existing financing to the actual specifics of artists and arts organizations, um, that those details matter because otherwise the kind of people who tend to have their visions realized are um, people aided and abetted by consultants, people with pre-existing access to significant resources. Um, this is why, um, you know, so many communities you end up seeing um, corporate chains come in because it's not just that they have the money, they, they have lawyers. They can, they can just sort of plow through these things, can be insurmountable barriers for the people who in many cases have actually been doing the work, who have that local level expertise. Um, you know, I'm a big proponent of the, the people know how 
And um, yet there's still this reflexive tendency to, you know, we need to bring in the consultants. So, um, you know, again, being, being willing to talk about, okay, how do we actually ensure that someone can renovate this structure? Um, because, you know, the sort of late 20th century fantasy of this heroic homesteading that I talked about, you know, um, you need to actually figure out, you know, who's going to wield the crowbar and who's going to rebuild the walls and who's going to make sure that the building isn't considered illegal. You know, how do you, how do you bring this kind of late 20th century idea of an urban space into our present moment so that people can stay in the structures they renovated. You know, it's, it's all those details. Well, well, two things I'll give you a little sneak peek on. We will have an arts and education district here in the city and there will be a community stakeholder meeting um, for all arts and cultural organizations and educational institutions within the district. Um, so you're on the list, Emma, but it's also a public meeting and it will be held at the end of the month. We're just um, uh, working with our um, urban planner, Chris Watson right now to talk about some of those issues about zoning. And um, I'm looking forward to the conversation and all the input that folks are gonna share. Oh, and then for the art space initiative, as we were thinking about it, I did have to bring in some consultants, but specifically some consultants who had expertise working with artists and real estate, because what good would it do to just throw out there, okay, here are three city owned properties that, you know, you can have if you can renovate them when we know that artists don't necessarily have the skills to do that. We want artists and art organizations to be successful. And so with the launch of the Art Space Initiative here in our city, we're gonna provide technical assistance workshops to help them, give them space planning one-on-one, -on -one, you know, how to finance a project, how to partner, what kind of partnerships do you need, how to prepare uh, a budget, you know, all of those basics and tools that I feel like would benefit them as opposed to just putting a, a blanket RFP that might intimidate, um, you know, folks from even applying before they even start. Yeah, that, that level of specificity where, you know, it's like all the details are considered and all the, the resources and the sort of primacy of resources are considered. Yeah, that's that's what's needed to have a, a different story. So that sounds great. It's so slow going, but we're, we're, you know, I'm, I'm in and of the community. So I feel like I have a, a added advantage um, and we have an added advantage in having an art spare. Of course, I'm gonna root for my mayor. I'm sorry, I, I, I don't apologize for that. <laughs> so, um... So we need to, to, to start wrapping up, right? Because we're a, a little over time already. And um, so what I'd like to do is maybe just give everyone a, a chance to very briefly, like 30 seconds or a you know, minute or whatever, um, say any any uh, final comments, thoughts, whatever, whatever is in your head right now um, that uh, you feel like is uh, important to bring to this conversation or something that's come from this conversation. Um, so we'll just... I, I'll, we'll go through and, and maybe we can hear from everyone very briefly. Um, so, um, Nicole, do you want, do you, do you want to start? Is that okay? I mean, I know it's like a weird thing to like call on people, but d would you, would you like to start with our uh, wrap up comment? Oh, Nicole. Oh, sorry. You I thought I hear. said Noel. I sorry. Yeah, yeah. I could tell. <laughs> yeah, I was like, said those, Noel. Names, those names sound very yeah, much alike totally, when you're. <laughs> I, I could totally, um, totally start. And this has been so great. And I, I'm like excited to go to Newark, and I'm excited about your mayor and envious. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that this just very simple is that I think we can use number one, like my my colleague Ashley Minner, who's a, an artist of the Lumbee community, Indigenous community in East Baltimore, taught me um, when she worked with me at UMBC, pay artists pay them well, 
always pay them. Uh, and I really learned from that. And I, I do these, um, these zines that um, one of my students who's an artist, Markel Cullens, and I put his info in the chat because he's amazing. And he was a student, but he graduated and he did these amazing zines that we take out into the community to talk with people. And he continues to, he's much more expensive now because he just graduated and, and it's a successful young man. I think he's working with Mary on some, some stuff with Chicory from East Baltimore. But you pay artists, but you also see art as this thing that is a communication for me being a humanities professor uh, and not an artist. I love art because it's a great way to start a conversation with people and bring people together. And that's where I, I really think we can look towards equity and look towards accessibility. And I think some of the things really family that you were saying about having consultants who can work with people because getting access to people, not everyone knows how to um, do grants. And I, I don't know how to design beautiful things like this, but I can write a grant because I'm academic. So we all need to come together and collaborate and use the arts to make our cities more equitable and better places. So uh, I'm looking forward to coming to visit you guys in Newark soon, seeing some of the things you talked about. You are welcome anytime, Nicole, for sure. Uh, Fami, do you want uh, to make any wrap up comments briefly? Well, the only thing I want to plug for people in Baltimore is my sister has a restaurant called My Mama's Vegan in Baltimore that was voted the number one vegan restaurant in the Baltimore Sun last year. Um, I have a special connection with Baltimore and, um, you know, we're all, I, I think listening is key and just knowing that there is um, what Dave just mentioned in the chat, I'm gonna read it. He said, the power that comes with expertise can be reined in by co-design with stakeholders and particip participatory action research that gives stakeholders actual decision-making power. I agree with that. Awesome. And I'm excited to try your sister's restaurant the next time I'm in Baltimore. Um, Emma, do you want to, uh, do you have any wrap up thoughts? Sure. Um, I, I feel like one of the moments of great beauty and clarity for me in the 20 years of being involved with Gallery Faro and being in Newark has been a, a series of moments where I just felt like I understood um, who I wanted to work for and who I was working for. And again, I know that sounds very simple on the surface, but um, you know, there would be these, these moments um, at interesting intervals, just even in the city's trajectory in my own sort of life in my 20s and 30s and now 40s, um, where um, I think it's really important um, just to, to constantly ask yourself that. And um, it's useful sometimes because if say you're in a room with people, they may feel themselves to be working or wanting to be work for a very different set of people. And it just helps you understand um, what you might be attempting to do. Um, and so one, one of those moments um, was the night that we opened 22 shows concurrently in five different spaces all on our block in one night. And there were about eight or 900 people all out together. Um, and it felt like we had sort of made our own fun. We had made our own beauty um, on very limited resources. Um, one of those very limited resources was sleep. Uh, no one involved with the undertaking had, had gotten any for about a month, but this very young woman came up to me and she said, could it be like this every night? <laughs> and um, that's really all I can say is just, it's like, that's who I wanna work for. And that keeps me steady. Um, and it reminds me of, of what I'm trying to do and who I might wanna do it with. And that's all I've got. Noel, what are your last wrap up thoughts? <laughs> sure. Um, I just want to encourage people to visit my project, <laughs> Black Power 19th Century. Uh, it's a multimedia uh, virtual exhibition, but it also includes some of kind of the projects we're talking about tonight, right? So I have um, basically the project is looking at. African American activists in the 1800s. And um, through kind of these corporate partnerships, I've been able to do a couple of projects like buy billboards, kind of like documenting the spaces that were destroyed 
by that black activist in the 1800s where they actually fought against slavery and fought for their voting rights um, that were destroyed. And so people get to actually like see the spaces. And um, that that was with the Newark artist um, Newark artist collaboration. And one of the most important things for me for that was just to make sure that the um, website would be um, connected to the project, which we're working on, and they agreed with that. And that was because Rebecca Jampol has really like aligned herself with um, artists and, you know, representing, um, representing interests and making sure we get paid and also um, pushing for things like that for um, Audible to be connected to the words like Black Power. But going um, back to other things, it's just, I, I feel that, um, and then with the project, you know, it's about history making, but it's also about the process of expanding how we think about Black lives in these cities like Newark, like Baltimore, like Brooklyn, like Manhattan, and how we've been engaged in various different ways. We're not parasites of a city. We are co-contributors of the cities in dynamic ways. Um, I think the most important message I would wanna leave today with for all artists, whether they're Black, white, um, and Latino, that's Latinos that are Black, white, or Indigenous, <laughs> or Asian, whatever you are is I think the most important thing for me always is for people to dream big and push for what turns them on and what innovation is and um, to go for that. And I know in a lot of ways that's problematic, but uh, I think a key step is to to dream it. Don't feel that it's only like the white boys with the money who can dream big and pop out and do all these amazing things. Dream big. And then if it takes a minute for you to get on or a couple of years to get on or decades, you know, I think for me, that's the spiritual um, thing that undergirds that. Look for various opportunities and take advantage of those opportunities. Um, and even though as Mary and we've all discussed today, you know, there is just very kind of confusing spaces, but I just want to encourage all artists to do that. Amen. Yeah. Thank you all so much. And I know we're over time, so I'm going to turn it back to Jack for any closing comments, but I just want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for a fantastic conversation. Uh, no comments. I can't really add to what's been said. It's just been beautifully uh, said together, raising lots of uh, complex questions, nuanced and um, I, I really hope everybody um, uh, would be interested in pursuing some of these questions because we clearly need to just keep on talking. So thank you so much. And we're gonna send everyone who's been tuning into this uh, a copy of the link to the tape and please pass it around and we'll put it on our website as well. Uh, thank you, Mary, uh, for this book and, and creating this space and, and really bring this together. Thank you, all the panelists. Um, it's been really a fantastic experience. I learned a lot. So everybody be well and have a great evening.